Good morning. Um, a few months ago, I was approached by the Department for International Development in the UK, who were in the process of putting together a guide for their own staff, for the education advisors who work with ministries of education and with programs around the world. And they were wrestling with a problem, which was that they were always being asked uh, for a view on whether or not they should support educational technology programs. And proposals for programs like that came very frequently in very many countries. And their staff were often in a position of going, I, I really, I'm not sure. What do, you know, do we have a line on this? What, what kind of educational technology do we support? Do we have a view about whether or not there's any evidence that this is an appropriate thing to do? And DFID were wanting to take some first steps to look at providing some fairly straightforward answers to those kind of questions from their team and to give them some guidance about what they should do in relation to proposals for educational technology. So I've been working with them over the last few months to look at trying to answer that seemingly innocent question of does educational technology make a difference to teaching and learning? And if so, what's, what's the evidence for that? First of all, what do we mean by educational technology? And the Department for International Development in the UK is using uh, the definition up on screen at the moment as a working definition. It's about digital or electronic technologies and materials and supporting teaching and learning. I think the meaning of educational technology has been contested and argued about over uh, many decades now. Uh, but it's increasingly recognized that it's not just about the technology. It's also about the processes of teaching and learning, about the communities that you build around that, about the practices that those communities engage in, how you design and support and implement programs. And so when we're talking about educational technology, I don't just mean the mobile phone or the radio or the computer, but we mean the package of support and uh, implementation that goes with that. In terms of evidence, uh, we've got a quote from a, a recent paper on this, uh, which is saying, actually, quite often, it's very difficult for educational policymakers and for donors and governments to make informed decisions about educational technology, because the evidence base is very weak and mixed. Uh, I think a lot of people would contend with that statement. But a colleague, uh, Professor Moon, speaking at the launch of the Global Monitoring Report uh, in uh, March this year, so actually maybe the issue is that the kind of evidence that the educational research community is coming up with isn't the kind of evidence that the uh, policymakers and the donors need to be able to uh, answer the questions that they've got to make and the decisions that they make. But it's certainly the case that there's been a focus on the provision of equipment and access to technology, there's been much less focus on the quality of what people do with the technology when they've got access to it. And just as over the last decade, the global discourse about education has shifted from access, it's not uh, sufficient to talk anymore about attention, uh, sorry, attendance at school, uh, it's got to move on to the quality of education. And in the same way that uh, change in in dialogue is reflected in educational technology. So the evidence for educational technology, I think, is mixed generally. If we come to the context of low to lower middle income countries, it's, it's even more mixed. Uh, there's a recent review by the uh, Asian Development Bank uh, looking across countries in Central and West Asia. And their uh, analysis of that was really that uh, in most of the education systems they looked at, there's an emphasis on hardware provision and a, a belief that actually providing kits, putting computers into schools, is an answer to lots of educational problems and the thinking really hasn't moved much beyond the provision of hardware and access to technology. That was uh, 2012. There are some studies that look beyond access and these typically focus on learning outcomes in a, a, a quantitative way. Uh, most recently, McEwen last year uh, reviewed a large number of randomized control trials and found that of all the different kinds of interventions in primary schools that they looked at, 
uh, educational technology had the largest effect size. It was the one thing that you could do that made the biggest difference. Unfortunately, that effect size was 0.15, and reviews of educational interventions more broadly suggest that actually a, a benchmark of 0.4 is the minimum that you should look at for something being meaningful. So although there is evidence of educational technology from McEwen as being important, actually, I think when you look at that in a broader context, you have to question what that difference of 0.15 actually meant for teachers and students in the schools. So the Educational Technology Topic Guide is really intended to try and give some practical advice to uh, people who have to make policy decisions about the nature of evidence, what works, what evidence is there that it works, and what kind of things might we do to try and get more and better quality evidence in the future. The process that we went to is to review about 80 studies, including research reports, project reports, and literature reviews to appraise those against criteria of transparency and rigor and validity of the research that was being presented, and then to take the studies that met those criteria and then analyze them for whether or not they presented evidence of change in classroom practice or learning outcomes and what that evidence told us. So what did we find? We broke this down into two kinds of um, technology use. Firstly, we looked at examples where teachers were using the technology in classrooms with their students, but the students themselves didn't get their hands on. And I think in many instances, the multimedia classrooms that we heard about earlier would come into this category. So the technology is being used in the classroom, but it's the teacher who's using it. And then secondly, we looked at examples where students are directly using the technology themselves. So I'm going to start by quickly looking at some of the forms of educational technology which did have evidence of impact um, on classroom practice and learning outcomes. There were lots of studies of interactive radio instruction that showed evidence of impact on learning outcomes. And just to give you a, a flavor of those, a uh, recent World Bank review found average effect sizes of plus 0.5, that's above the benchmark, then educationally meaningful changes. A more recent review uh, of looking across randomized control trials uh, by Ho and Thrukal found uh, effect sizes widely varying from slightly negative, they, they made things a little bit worse, to very strongly positive results of PLUS. And they, they said the, the variation for that was really down to the quality of implementation, the quality of monitoring, how, how closely they observed and followed up the, uh, the programs, and crucially, the quality of local support that was given to teachers. And the largest effect sizes from interactive radio instruction are really only seen with very young learners. Very, very good for children in grades one and two, much less effective for older learners. Although there's quite a lot of studies that talk about IRI improving learning outcomes, there are very, very few studies that actually tell you what happens differently in a classroom from IRI. We were only able to identify two that presented any evidence of changes in classroom practice. The first, from Guinea, uh, was a program that aimed to encourage teachers' respect for students. And they found a, a fairly basic level of improvement, I think, but teachers hit students less regularly at the end of the program than they did before. And I, I, I'd hope for a slightly higher level of improvement than that, but it's a, a good place to start, I suppose. Uh, but they also found that teachers gave students more time to understand. They, they didn't rush through topics. They actually gave students more time to develop their understanding. They were more patient with students. I think what's crucial about this is that didn't just happen from IRI but it was a combination of interactive radio instruction for the students and a radio-based peer-supported model of professional development for the teachers. And interestingly, the only other example we could find of IRI instruction that gave any evidence of changes in practice was similarly IRI for the students, radio-supported professional development for the teachers. This time uh, in Mali, and they found uh, an increased awareness of the, the pedagogic techniques that were being promoted by the program by teachers and an increased use of those techniques. Now, I know you're not going to be able to see this graph at all, but <laughs> let me tell you what it says. The reason I've shared this is because it's incredibly rare. 
This is um, some data from the project in Mali where they've quantitatively measured the percentage of teachers who were aware of the techniques they were promoting and the percentage of teachers who's carried out those techniques in their lessons. And this kind of quantitative observation of what did teachers do in the classroom, assign the number to it, is very, very rare. Most of the, the studies that we've seen presented no quantitative evidence of change in classroom. I've got three or four during the course of this presentation, but of the 80 studies we looked at, that's about how rare quantitative evidence of change in classroom practice is. Okay, similar to IRI perhaps, we also found evidence of uh, mobiles being used to bring classroom audio into lessons, and again in the context of teacher professional development. This is from English in Action in Bangladesh, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about that later from uh, other speakers and panel members. Just in summary, um, there are lots of studies from EIA that talk to both classroom practice and learning outcomes. They're large-scale studies, the classroom practice is systematic, and again, like the example I just showed you, they're quantitative measures of improvements in classroom practice. Uh, EIA demonstrates increases in the use of target language, increases in student talk time, and increased use of pair and group work uh, through their studies. And they also show substantial increases in the number of primary and secondary students achieving uh, competency through independent assessments. Similar to that, uh, we also found one program, Bridge IT, that is operating in India and in Tanzania that uh, uses not audio in the classroom but video from a teacher's mobile phone displayed either on a projector or a, uh, a large television. And again, in the context of activity guides and professional development for the teachers. Again, there are systematic observations of classroom practice in here, and uh, increases in India, at least, of 31% of the lessons being recorded as high quality. They don't unpack what high quality means, so I'm, I'm not sure what they were actually observing that led them to that conclusion, but it's a, obviously there must be some process behind it that generates this figure. And again, the Bridge IT program improvements in learning outcomes, both in Tanzania and in India, in English language uh, and in science although the, the results are variable. In Tanzania, they, they improved in both subjects. In India, they improved the science results, but not the English language ones. Finally, um, one more study of teachers' use of mobile devices. In Kenya, the Primer program had three different kinds of intervention. They gave students e-readers. They had another student, um, treatment group where students had no technology, but the teacher had a tablet for their own professional development. And they had another teacher group where the students and the teachers had no technology, but the teacher educators had a tablet for their professional development. I'm just going to focus on the teacher bit at the moment. Uh, this was a program for improving early literacy. It's a research report that's just come out this year. And they found that the teacher tablets and the teacher educator tablets produced exactly the same improvements in student learning outcomes as the students' use of e-readers. So they found it was just as, you got just as good change from giving the teacher a device as you did from giving every student a device. Although the teacher's devices were more expensive, you needed much less of them, so it was very much cheaper to give the teachers devices. And therefore, they found the cost effectiveness of giving educational technology to teachers in this early reading program to be about 10 times higher than using uh, mobile devices for students. This is one of the very, very few studies that reports on cost effectiveness or value for money. And one of the things that we think that we've learned from this is that this is an area that's really under researched and under um, reported. And there needs to be a lot more work on the methodology of how do you look at cost effectiveness and value for money in programs like this. Okay. We'll move on and look very quickly at technology used by students. So this is where students have the technology, they're, they're using it hands-on themselves. I think the first thing to say, if you remember from the quote at the beginning, it said, um, you know, it's not about access to education, it's about to, to educational technology. It's about what the quality is of what you do with it. And there's an awful lot of literature that we looked at 
that says providing access to technology on itself makes absolutely no difference to the quality of teaching or the quality of learning. And just to give you a few examples, the Enlasis program in Chile is a phenomenally ambitious program. It's been running for very many years. They've increased access to ICT in nearly 9,000 state schools across Chile. Enormous investment and very ambitious and very well-designed program in many respects. But the evaluation carried out in 2011 came to the view that actually when they surveyed the teachers, they found people aren't really using this very much. Um, similarly, in Myanmar, 33,000 schools or more have been provided with computer suites and, and very extensive ICT and networking. But the findings of the evaluation last year, well, the use of ICT by te for teaching and learning is very low. They really got very little out of this educationally. Um, one laptop per child. Peru, thousands of, of computers being given to individual students. The first evaluation of one laptop per child that's looked at learning outcomes and classroom practices, uh, published in 2012. And despite increasing access tenfold, the program didn't have any effect on the quality of instruction in class. Laptop use was directed to activities of little or no educational value, was the, the finding of the review. So just giving students access to computers is totally a waste of time, unless you have something that moves beyond access to quality of teaching and learning. We did find a, a very few examples of students' benefit from computer use. These were in terms of classroom practices rather than measured learning outcomes. The things that seem to be really relevant there, the, the studies that did report this, were really around project-based inquiry. They provided educational resources to students. They provided professional training to teachers on encouraging independent learning and project-based learning and collaborative learning. And students engaged with this and were able to learn independently of the teacher. I think one of the other things that's interesting, two of those studies, the students themselves in interviews said, actually, do you know, we learn much better in a group. We don't want one laptop each. We don't want one computer each. That's not helpful. What we really want is to have a computer or a laptop and work with a group of our friends because we learn much more talking to each other and thinking about what we're doing together than we do on our own. And the students suggested ideal group sizes for computer equipment for students between three and five from those various studies. There's also slightly unusual in, in the context of all the other things. There are some examples of computer-assisted learning in mathematics being of benefit. Where they were used as a replacement for regular teaching, they made things worse or made no difference. But where they were used as a supplement to teaching, particularly for children from disadvantaged communities or from students who were falling behind, they, they had some benefit as a remedial program for those particular students. Where we did see many studies suggesting this was a beneficial practice was in relation to students' use of e-readers or tablets for the development of early literacy. And there are a number of studies uh, all of which were around phonics-based uh, literacy programs, professional development programs for teachers that were accompanied by students' use of e-readers. And they sh uh, showed in a variety of different measures in a variety of different contexts that these programs were effective in improving uh, literacy and fluency in both mother tongue and English language. So looking across that, what do we see? Well, the programs that really didn't make any difference seem to be limited in looking primarily at hardware, or they, they, uh, when they reported on the lack of impact they had, they would often say things like, we, you know, we didn't have enough materials that were appropriate, or we, we didn't have enough support to the teachers to enable them to change, or we didn't have enough support uh, from the head teachers to really get this implemented. When we look at the programs that do have impact of change, I think without exception, all of them have these four characteristics. They had a clear curriculum and pedagogic focus. And what I mean by that is that they didn't just focus on what the teacher's going to do. So it's, they focused on 
what children are going to do and how they're going to be engaged in different kind of activities that are relevant to learning science or learning history, or you might put it another way, to becoming a poet or a writer or a scientist or a historian. What's the practice of those disciplines? And how can the use of technology help students engage in that practice in different or more meaningful ways? And the, the programs that really made a difference could articulate that. They understood what the kind of change to student learning was that they were trying to promote. They supported that change with relevant curriculum materials for the students. There wasn't any example we found that didn't include the use of uh, appropriate curriculum resources for students. They were all backed up by programs of teacher development that were not about, as we heard earlier, they weren't about bogus activities of learning how to make a Word document. They were focused on the curriculum and the pedagogy that was being promoted. And I suspect because they had a clear idea of what they were trying to do, the nature of change they wanted to introduce, they were also able to monitor and evaluate the success of introducing that change in the classroom. And those characteristics were found in all of the programs that had evidence of change. And with that caveat, in the context of those conditions being met, we found several forms of technology that seemed to be particularly appropriate in improving learning. Interactive radio instruction, especially for early primary years. Student tablets and e-readers, especially for early literacy programs. Classroom and audio and video resources in the context of teacher professional development on mobile phones. Digital resources for supporting independent and collaborative project-based work and remedial programs in computer-assisted learning in mathematics. There's lots we didn't know. Looking across these studies, there's very little that's said about how you support and enable teachers to develop appropriate relevant practices with educational technology. And we think a lot more needs to be understood about that. And there's very little that's said about how such practices are enacted in the classroom. So programs say what the intention is, but if you look for actually accounts of what happens in the classroom, how do teachers do that in the context of a rural school with 100, 100 students in the class and intermittent electricity and everything else. How do they manage it? What do they do? There are very, very few accounts that explain clearly how that works in practice at the classroom level. In fact, most of the studies that we looked at, uh, apart from the few that I've summarized here, present little or no evidence of what happens in the classroom. So we think, actually, what happens when you introduce these programs? How do they work? Is really an area that needs a lot more understanding. And finally, our recommendations. And these are really addressed at uh, education advisors and policy makers. We think educational technology programs should focus upon enabling educational change and, and to be able to clearly articulate that. It's not about delivering technology. It's about delivering change in classroom practice and students' learning. In order to do that, they must provide adequate support to teachers and schools. And there are other studies, like the review uh, from the Epicenter by Joe Westbrook recently, that says what, what kind of support we know is effective in doing that. And they've got to be able to capture the changes in teaching practice and learning outcomes. We think advisors should encourage proposals that either build on practices that we have some evidence that works, so the kind of things we outlined in the previous slide, we think you should support programs that look like that. But there might be other innovative programs that take different approaches, but will do something to address that gap in the knowledge. They'll tell us more about how you support teachers effectively to introduce change, or they'll tell us more about how that works in the classroom in lower uh, economic developed contexts. We think advisors should discourage proposals that emphasize technology over education, that offer weak programmatic support to teachers, or have poor evaluation that stops at what you did instead of the outcome of what you did. And finally, we think there's a lot more work to be done about value for money and cost effectiveness, mm -hmm. and how you begin to measure and compare that. I think I'm one minute over the 25 minutes I was aiming for, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>